Thank you for having me here this evening. I am especially grateful because I have been having terrible problems with jobs in, in recent months. Uh, I went to work for a while in a tailor shop, for example, but uh, I just wasn't suited for it. <laughs> so, well, it was a so-so job. <laughs> then, then I worked for a while in a bank, but I lost interest. And then I went to work in an orange juice factory, yeah, but I got canned. I, I, I just couldn't concentrate. So then I lost a job due to illness. Yeah, the boss got sick of me. So I'm really happy to be here tonight and grateful to all of you for being here in order to make that happen. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask once again for a volunteer to stop me at 7.30. There's a clock right there, but I won't look at it. If there would be somebody who would be willing to hold up your hand at 7.30, approximately 20 minutes from now, just to give me a signal, will you do that? I realize that it's a bit of an imposition because you have to watch your watch, but I don't have a watch, and even if I did, I, I wouldn't look at it. Thank you very much. I believe last time we more or less scanned the first 1,000 years of the history and the development of the English language, talking about so-called Old English and so-called Middle English and the, the beginnings of the first and the transition to the second taking place as a result of the Norman invasion and the French influence on the English language beginning in the middle of the 10 hundreds AD. Middle English was the language of Geoffrey Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales. There were other books being written and printed, of course, after the invention of the printing press. The bringing of the printing press technology to England is an interesting story involving a guy named William Caxton. It's possible that you have heard of him. He went to Germany. Uh, he was English, but he went to Germany specifically to learn the new technology of printing. The first book printed in English was actually printed in what they called Flanders, what we call Belgium today, by this fellow, William Caxton. The year was about 1574. In fact, he wrote the work, translating it, I should say, from the French. It was a French retelling, a romance uh, involving the Trojan War, an ancient classical topic. And uh, apparently it did pretty well. Two years later, in 1476, Caxton moved to London and set up the very first printing press in England, uh, quite close to Westminster Abbey, incidentally, and was very successful for the rest of his professional printing career, the, the first publisher in the English language. Almost a hundred works came out of his press. In the year 1500, we date the beginnings, by the way, of the Renaissance or the modern era of English language studies to the year 15, or 1475 with the ascent to the British throne of a guy named Henry Tudor, who later became known as Henry VII. He was the first of the five Tudor monarchs who lent their name to the ensuing age of development in England, the Tudor age, which includes at its tail end Queen Elizabeth I and of course William Shakespeare and the other great writers of the early Renaissance period of English language history. In the year 1500, it is estimated that there had been about 35,000 books printed in all of Europe in the first 25 years or so of the English language publications, these books were being churned out in all languages. But between 1500 and 1640, it's estimated there were as many as 20,000 books printed in England alone. Okay, these numbers give an idea of the explosion in the market demand for books. Literacy was on the rise. In the year 1500, it is estimated that perhaps 2 to 4 percent of the people in England could read and write, almost all of them church people, okay, priests and bishops. By the year 1500, 100 years later, that number was pushing 50 percent. This had to do with a lot of things, including the rise of the middle class, the rise of the trade guilds, anybody who wanted a, a career in any sort of craft or merchant had to be a member of a guild. Well, the guild published their records and rules in written form, and more and more members of the middle class were learning to read. This was only one factor. 
there was the uh, increasing, uh, almost uh, un unbelievable explosion in interest in other areas of the globe. In the Renaissance, for the first time in English history, the English people were beginning to look beyond their own shores. And many of them, like a guy named Sir Walter Raleigh, for example, were dreaming of possibilities. In the year 1584, when William Shakespeare was 20 years old, this Walter Raleigh conceived the idea of permanent settlement in other areas of the globe by English people. And toward that end, in 1584, did I talk about Walter Raleigh last time? I, I didn't think so. In the year 1584, Raleigh paid out of his own pocket for the very first efforts at exploration by English people of the East Coast of what is today the United States of America. The following year, 1585, Raleigh again pays for the first ever attempt at permanent settlement, what we later called colonies, by the English in what was to become the United States of America, place near what is today Roanoke, Virginia. It was a failure. It was a group of about 90 men and boys, no women. That's probably why it failed. <laughs> After after less than a year, the would-be settlers returned to England, discouraged, but Raleigh was undaunted. And the next year, 1587, Raleigh again pays out of his own pocket for a larger, more ambitious, more heavily organized effort at colonization. It also was a failure. A group of about 114 men, women, and children, again Roanoke in what is today North Carolina. After about the first six months, the leader of the group, a man named John White, had to return to England for more supplies and hopefully more settlers. But he was delayed in leaving England because of the Spanish Armada, 1588, this great threatened invasion by the Spanish of England. The English government confiscated all ships in case they needed them to fight the possible invasion. As a result, no one could leave the country. It wasn't until two and a half years after White left Roanoke that he was finally able to get back there. And when he did, all of the people, all 114 men, women, and children were simply gone, mysteriously disappeared. No signs of violence. The fort they built was still intact. But you may have read or heard about the infamous or notorious lost colony. Uh, it was not until 17 years later, in the year 1607, that the English finally succeeded in establishing a permanent presence in what is today the United States of America, a place called Jamestown, a little further north in what is today Virginia, uh, which Raleigh incidentally named. He named that whole region of the mid-Atlantic states Virginia in honor of who? Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth, one of whose nicknames was the Virgin Queen because she never married. She was a brilliant statesman and politician. She used her marital status, among other things, as just one of the tools in her kit to help maneuver England into a position of power and influence in European politics. But interestingly enough, from our point of view as Americans, the government, at least at that time, was not at all involved in these early attempts at establishing an English presence in what is today North America. Okay, It was purely capitalism, an entrepreneurial effort on the part of investors. Raleigh and the people he worked with were hoping to make money. In 1607, that effort at Jamestown, incidentally, was sponsored not by Raleigh. He was not in charge this time. He was involved, but not in charge. It was the results of the effort of a group of London businessmen calling themselves simply the London Company, about 20 or 25 of them. But Raleigh was personally involved with recruiting some number of those investors. How many, I don't know. It was at least one or two, possibly a few more. And he put in much of his own money into the enterprise. It's not too much to say that it was Walter Raleigh who brought the English language to our country, even though our country was still a couple of hundred years in the future. There were many reasons why the people in England were borrowing words from other languages. Again, the rise in economic activity, the, the interest in navigation and exploration. This is the age of the great Elizabethan sea dogs. Perhaps you have heard of Sir John Hawkins, Sir Walter Raleigh, probably the most famous Sir Francis Drake. In the year 1580, when Will Shakespeare was 16 years old and still a small town boy out in the sticks of western Warwickshire in England, 
a guy named Francis Drake and his crew completed the first circumnavigation of the globe by English people. And it was only the second time in history it had ever been done by anyone. Can you imagine the effect that that would have had on, a, on the mind of a 16-year-old kid like Will Shakespeare living out in the country? It was exciting for everybody, of course. But I've often pondered his reaction when he first heard it, especially because I can remember when I was 21 years old, 20 years old, and people first landed on the moon. Everybody in this room is probably old enough to remember that, and perhaps the uh, excitement and the wonder that you felt. Well, it's not too much of an exaggeration, I don't think, to say that the same thing was going on in the minds of many English people. They were inspired by the possibilities for the future that the new world represented. Later, of course, religious tension, political problems, all contributed to the development of the English presence in North America. One of the things they harvested out of this experience was a whole host of new words that they didn't have to describe things um, from the New World. They borrowed them from Indian languages. I'll get into more detail about that later. In the meantime, there were other things going on language-wise. In the year 1604, the very, very first dictionary of sorts, we wouldn't think of it as a dictionary, was published in London. It was called a table alphabetical. They didn't even use the, the word dictionary. And it was specifically marketed toward members of the middle class who wanted to imitate or ape their betters, that is, their social superiors, people who were more educated. It was basically a, a list of polysyllable words, and the, the, again, the idea was so that you could appear in social circles, in casual conversation on the street, to be more educated than you were. Uh, we'll talk later about the first real dictionaries. There were, other, there were authors, of course, who were becoming influential. People were beginning to read serious literature of varying kinds for the first time. One of the more successful writers in the early 1500s was Sir Thomas More. He's better remembered today for things other than authorship, but he did write books which were especially uh, circulated among people interested in politics and government. He is credited with coining the terms absurdity, contradictory, exaggeration, indifference, monopoly, and paradox. Most of those he put together from Greek and Latin words. Many other writers were educated as schoolboys growing up from the age of seven to the age of 15 or 16, attending the grammar schools in the small, small towns and cities throughout the country, and they were using the Latin and Greek languages to make new English words, which is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, pride in the language, it's fair to say, began to develop for the first time. At least in print we have expressions of how people in England were beginning to think our language is worthy of publication. It's worthy of great works of literature. Even before William Shakespeare set the, uh, raised the bar for that sort of effort, scientific works were being published from English into other languages. The French, the Germans, the Dutch, the Spanish, and especially the Italians were beginning to pay attention to this foreign language. And many of their scholars, and what we would call translators, were busy publishing English works in their languages. But at the same time of, as this pride was developing, so was our first indication of language anxiety, a thing which infests the minds of people to this day in the English world. One of the first examples that we have is from a guy named Sir Thomas Eliot. Apparently he was a mid-level bureaucrat in the government. And in the year 1631, he wrote a book called The Book Named the Governor. I've never read it, but in the introduction to that book, he actually apologized to his readers for using the word maturity. Maturity. We will laugh at that, of course. We take that word for granted today. But in his book, he was sincerely concerned that he might offend readers. He admitted that the word was, quote, strange and dark, meaning obscure, but which would soon, in his words, be, quote, facile to understand as other words late come out of Italy and France, unquote. <laughs> Indeed, the, the English people were borrowing words wholesale from French and Italian, among other places. There had been a number of English versions of the Bible printed in England before the famous 
King James Version. The King James, as you may know, was first published in 1611. William Shakespeare may have read it, probably did, but his plays are sluiced with biblical references. He knew his Bible. Any educated person in those days knew their Bible well, and many of them had studied an English translation of the Bible. In the wake of the Protestant Reformation, one of the great issues in the Reformation, as you may know, was the idea of printing the Bible in native languages rather than having to rely on priests and bishops to interpret Greek and Latin scripts. Again, this had to do with the rise in the literacy rate. It's no coincidence that the Protestant Reformation in England happened during the Renaissance, during the growth of the middle class and the growth of education generally. I neglected to mention that the government, for the first time in English history, was getting interested in literacy. During the reign of Edward VI, the boy king, the son and successor of Edward VIII, they, or, or Henry VIII, they passed a law whereby the government created, during Edward's reign, almost a hundred so-called grammar schools. Now, they were just for the boys in the towns and the cities, the kids out in the country where the preponderance of the population still lived, did not have access to these schools. But at least in the cities and towns, more and more boys were getting educated at government expense. Anyway, this anxiety about the language bubbled over into something called inkhorn terms. This was a term d devised by some people who could write, criticizing other people who were publishing books for using corrupting words, foreign words, made up words, and other words which the critics regarded as being not plain English, okay? Here are a few examples of inkhorn, well, Ben Jonson, the famous contemporary of Will Shakespeare, wrote a play in which he included a scene in which the poet John Marston is tied to a chair and forced to regurgitate learned borrowings of reprehensible words such as, and these are all included in the uh, scene, retrograde, reciprocal, defunct, and inflate. Now, John, Ben Jonson was a genius and a man of letters and learning himself. I can't imagine that he was really serious. We weren't hearing his view expressed. I think he was, I've read the play, I think he was, it's quite clear, he was satirizing the people who were afraid of new words that were coming into the language at that time, at least to some extent. Shakespeare summarized quite characteristically the whole debate with a very striking phrase in the plays Love, La Love's Labor's Lost, one of my favorite, although one of the more obscure Shakespeare comedies. There's a lover in that play named Baron. He's one of the lead characters. And at one point, he's declaring his love for the lady Rosaline to his friends, and he is specifically detailing to them the kind of language that he is going to use in wooing this lady. And what he says is that he will, quote, he, he, that he will shun, quote, taffeta phrases, silken terms precise. The imagery here is from cloth making. Does anybody know what taffeta is? It's a very fine fabric made from silk. It's expensive fabric. So, is, uh, so are silken terms. Instead, he says, he will woo his lady love by, quote, my wooing mind shall be expressed in russet yeas and honest kersey nose. Again, the imagery is from cloth making. Russet, today we regard it as a color. But does anybody know what kind of fabric it is or was? Well, it was made from wool, okay? It was a humble fabric worn by humble people. And kersey, similarly, was a kind of fabric made from wool. So again, the imagery is from cloth making, but Shakespeare is having Baron say, I will use plain English in wooing my lady love and not try to get fancy. Shakespeare was not the only word inventor of the time, but he was f the foremost. Here are just a handful. Accommodation, assassination, dexterously, dislocate, indistinguishable, obscene, premeditated, reliance, and submerged. I've seen different numbers as high as 2,000, as low as 800. The number you see most often for Shakespeare's words and phrases is about 1,800. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. I have now been talking nonstop for 20 minutes. I'm going to stop for 90 seconds. I'm going to ask you 
to turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what is the most important thing you've learned from me in the last 20 minutes or the most interesting or the most surprising. If you have nothing to say, that's okay, but you make sure that your neighbor says something to you. Now, can you do that for 90 seconds? Go. Anybody like another one? Pass, pass it on, pa please. Would you, would you like another? If not, just pass it on. Shakespeare not only invented words himself, he loved to play with new words, words which in many cases he had heard, or perhaps even read, elsewhere, but which he used in his plays and thereby made them popular, made them accepted by the general populace, because for the simple reason he was the most popular playwright at the time. In other words, to say that William Shakespeare invented a word or phrase can mean three or four different things. Sometimes he does appear to have simply made a word up out of his head, just whole cloth, and relied upon the context in the play or poem for the reader or audience member to comprehend the meaning of the word. At other times, he would take an already existing word and with his knowledge of Greek and Latin, add a suffix or a prefix and come up with a new word with a new meaning. Good example is the word unreal. The word real, with its present meaning, already existed. He added the UN prefix, which I think comes from Latin, and came up with the term unreal. And that's just one of many examples. At still other times, he would take an already existing word and use it as a new part of speech. Now remember, there were no grammar textbooks in those days. The whole structure of the English language, while you would recognize it if you could go back on the streets of London, you would, in a few days, your ear would, would quickly pick up the basically modern structure of the English language, allowing for vocabulary and local accents and so forth. But there was definitely, uh, uh, shall we say, a certain freedom in the grammar of the language that simply doesn't exist today. Grammatical forms, which are simply not allowed today, were commonly used back then. A form such as more braver or more hotter, it's more hotter today than it was yesterday. Today, if someone said that to you, you would mark them down as ignorant or uneducated. In Shakespeare's day, even educated men and women could and did construct a sentence pretty much however they wanted to. This is one of the things that makes it difficult for modern readers to read Elizabethan literature. Shakespeare's roots are betrayed in a number of words that he uses in his plays and poems that were not used by people outside of the county of Warwickshire. To this day, as small as England is, if you travel around, especially in the rural areas, you will hear words and phrases used in one locale that you will not hear in another part of the country. The same is true in the United States, although perhaps not as dramatically, I'm 65 years old, but I remember when I was 25 and moved to Houston, Texas in 1975, the first, term I heard, first time I heard the word Lollapalooza. <laughs> now, ironically, I've heard it in other parts of the country too, but 40 years ago, it was pretty much confined to rural areas of Texas. 
And there are other words too. Depending on where you grew up and where you have traveled, you may have noticed this difference in vocabulary. But if you have traveled in England, you will notice it a lot more. I can't tell you how many American, especially American tourists, have come back and said, golly, I was in this one part of Scotland and you cross a river or you go over a, a ridge or a hilltop and you'll be in a whole new language territory, even though officially it's the same language. Here are a few Warwickshire words that Will Shakespeare used because he grew up with them and he pushes them on his London audience. Ballow, B-A-L-L-O-W. It, it was a verb meaning to beat or to cudgel. The word batlet was related, B-A-T-L-E-T, -E a local term used until quite recently for the wooden stick that women would use when doing the laundry, back when they beat the clothes by hand. Uh, to frighten was the word gallow, G-A-L-L-O-W. We speak of a gallows for execution, but not specific. I wonder if there's a relationship between those two words. The noun geck, G-E-C-K, he uses that in Twelfth Night. It meant a fool. Honey stalks were stalks of clover flowers. Mobled is an adjective, M-O-B-L-E-D, meaning muffled, uh, pertaining to sound, dampening a sound. Pash, P-A-S-H, to smash. Potch, P-O-T-C-H, to thrust. Tear, T-A-R-R-E, to provoke or incite. And veils, V-A-I-L-S, were perks or tips offered, an extra payment for, for services rendered. So what? The whole reason I've read all, you, all those to you is simply to illustrate that Sir Francis Bacon, who was born and raised in Engli East Anglia, could not possibly have written the works of William Shakespeare. Amen. Sir Francis Bacon, however, also very influential in his own right. We don't think of him as being a writer, but he was. He was a philosopher and a scientist. And he is credited with coining the words agile, capsule, habitual, all from Latin, and catastrophe, lexicon, and thermometer all from Greek, that is, Greek roots and suffixes and prefixes, and he would put them together and make the, word, the new word. Other science words. Do you remember me telling you science was exploding at this time? Sir Francis Bacon was very much involved. He is considered today the father of the so-called scientific method. Uh, and that was more than just a philosophical development. Uh, atmosphere, pneumonia, and skeleton were other science words of the time. This does not mean that everybody was reading science works. Okay, but the ones who were, were influenced and in many cases picked up these terms and made them eventually mainstream English. One of my favorite examples is Galileo, who was Italian and did not even speak, read, or write English. But for the first time, his works were being translated into English. And he gave us words like encyclopedia, explain, and gravity. He didn't mean to give us those words. He was merely writing the results of his experiments. But they got translated into English, and now today we take them for granted as mainstream English. Vesalius, perhaps you've heard of the, uh, the famous anatomist of that time? Yes? I have a quick question. You said that there were grammar schools for boys, but then you said there were no grammar textbooks. What were they learning? Excellent question. When they spoke of grammar schools, they were referring to the curriculum, which was almost completely, or at least very heavily, Latin and Greek language and literature. A little bit of mathematics, a little bit of what we would call physical science, a tiny bit of history, but primarily the curriculum in the grammar schools during the Renaissance in England that William Shakespeare was very much uh, Im imbued with was Latin and Greek literature and not just studying the ancient writers in their own language and sometimes in translation, but memorizing copious amounts, especially the drama, for performance sometimes for their fellows in the classroom. They were not just expected to memorize, but stand up straight, breathe from here, open the mouth, what would later be called elocution. Can you imagine better schooling for a future actor and playwright? And again, all the, the educated young men were getting that. Did I talk to you about the education of women in the Renaissance? Okay, I like to include this because there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. It's common today to hear girls couldn't go to school at all. That's not exactly true. There were things called petty schools from the French word petite, which obtained in many, not all, but a great many of the cities and small towns. 
there were, there were at least two or three that operated during Shakespeare's lifetime in his hometown of Stratford. And they were specifically for both children of both genders from the ages of three till the ages of seven. And they were specifically for what we would call the three R's. They didn't study Latin and Greek, but they did learn basic reading and writing and arithmetic. So even the girls were entitled to that much formal education until age seven. Then the girls were sent home to learn domestic skills and the boys would go on to the grammar schools to learn the Latin and the Greek and a handful of other things. I like to say that because, for example, many, for many years, most scholars believe that William Shakespeare's mother, Mary Arden, was illiterate. Now there is a very strong consensus that no, she was not only able to read and write, she, we know that she administered her father's will while she was still in her teens. And he had eight daughters, she was the baby of the family. It's highly unlikely that a guy with Robert Arden's money and he was quite wealthy, what they called landed gentry in those days. It's highly unlikely that he would have made his daughter, he's 16, she might have been as old as 19. We don't know exactly when she was born. But the point is, he appointed her at his death co-executor of his will. And again, it was a very substantial estate. So there would have been a lot of responsibility there. Furthermore, her husband, Will Shakespeare's dad, John Shakespeare, was a very, very successful businessman in Stratford. And we know from many records that many, many wives of Elizabethan craftsmen and merchants worked right alongside their husbands in what, in effect, was the family business. And I believe, after a lifetime of study, that Will Shakespeare's mother fell into that category. So she could undoubtedly work mathematics Okay, and, and read and write. And I think that was probably more typical than we, we think. Again, not in the country, but at least in the cities and towns. And when in the play Macbeth, getting back to this business of local vocabulary in Shakespeare's play, uh, how many of you know the scene in Macbeth called the banquet scene? Where the ghost of the recently murdered Banquo comes to the banquet and only Macbeth can see the ghost. And Macbeth describes Banquo as, having, as being blood boltered, meaning having his hair matted with blood. Shakespeare, in writing that line, is referring to the Warwickshire term that was used of snow that was said to balter a horse's hooves. Apparently, under the right conditions, snow can collect around a horse's hooves and impede its ability to go through the snow. So Shakespeare, uh, once again, is falling back on local terms that he knew as a boy growing up in Stratford-on-Avon. Uh, I mentioned Vesalius, the Flemish anatomist, published his first works at that time, very influential in the area of medicine. And he is credited with giving us the words strenuous and excrescence. I admit the last word is not a common one, but it refers to any outgrowth of the human body, either normal, like hair and nails, or abnormal, like, like uh, warts or boils. In physics, have you ever heard of William Gilbert? He, he is considered one of the very first physicists, um, not as famous, of course, as, as uh, Galileo and others, but he is credited with giving us the English words external, chronology, and paradox. John Milton, who was born a, a generation after Shakespeare died, gives us the words disregard, hubbub, and pandemonium. Pandemonium is especially interesting. Pan from the Latin all and demon, demons. When all the demons come together, you have pandemonium. Not all new words were coming from Greek and Latin. French borrowings continued, even though in general relations between France and English were unfriendly, at least politically speaking, the influence of French culture on England continued and still does. We are still, as English speakers, borrowing French words. But the words bigot, detail, commerce, explore, mustache, which is one of my favorites. When you know it's a French word, it sounds so French. With that CH sound representing sh rather than ch as English speakers are wont to make it. Alloy, progress, tomato, bombast, volunteer, duel, and entrance all came into the language at about this time from the French. Montaigne was a contemporary of Shakespeare's. He's credited with giving us the essay form of writing. Indeed, he invents the word essay, which meant to try. 
And when you write an essay, what you're trying to do is convince a reader of your point of view. And incidentally, the verb equip is also credited to Montaigne. Uh, Italian architectural terms, like all the other countries in Europe at that time, the English architects were looking to Italy for inspiration. And it was Italian words that came to dominate that particular field. Here are just a few examples. Cupola, portico, stucco, balcony, and granite. Today, we think those words are so fundamental, but in the Renaissance, they were new. Other Italian words non-architecturally related, the word violin, the word volcano, and the word stanza are just a handful. One of my handouts, which you will get next time, is a list of Italian contributions to the um, uh, English language. I've got another page with, with Dutch and Polish, another page with just African language words, in American English especially, and a host of other ethnic or, uh, and national word origins. Spanish, the words that England was adopting from Spain at that time quite often uh, reflected the conflict between those two nations. They were generally at loggerheads. Desperado, embargo, and armada are just a few examples of that. Other Spanish terms comprise an interesting category. Let's see if you can figure out what it is. Cannibal, maize, tobacco, banana, cocoa, mulatto, potato, yam, and alligator. All of those words have one thing in common. Well, two. We, the English people at the time borrowed them from the Spanish language, but what do you suspect was also true? They all came from either the Americas or Africa. First into the Spanish, they were here before the English after all, borrowed from late, later, or from contemporary Indian cultures, and then later picked up in England. One of my favorites is alligator. The Spanish got that, uh, the, the English borrowed it from the Spanish, as I just said, but the Spanish got it from an Indian tribe in, guess where? Florida, Florida where the animal comes from. Dutch words. Any sailors in the room? Anybody have any experience with boats? Virtually all of the basic vocabulary of boating in English comes from the Dutch. Uh, not port and starboard, but uh, uh, smuggle and smuggler, reef, cruise, jib, mast, spar, on and on and on. Hull, the word hull of the boat, that's a Dutch word. Other Dutch words, non-nautical, that we adopted. Knapsack, blunderbuss, and tattoo. The first Arabic words adopted into the language, actually they weren't the first, but in large numbers because the first substantial English context, contact with the Middle East, commercial specifically, commercial contact, was taking place during the Renaissance. And it was during that period that our language absorbed the words sash, sofa, mohair, sherbet, for the dessert, hashish, and henna. And again, that's just a handful, just a small, tiny example. Words which are now archaic. If you're reading Shakespeare and you run up against a word and you've never heard of it before and you need to look at the footnote, that's not uncommon because many of the words that were taken for granted and customarily used by at least educated people at that time have simply dropped out of the language. Have you ever used a very old or very big dictionary and encountered the initials after an entry, O-B-S period? Meaning obsolete. Or alternatively, the O-E-D generally uses A-R-C-H period for R-K. Meaning, yes, it's a word in English, but we don't use it anymore. And you'll see a lot of them in the Elizabethan era. Adepted, and some of these words are rather attractive, by the way, and you kind of wish we'd get them back. Adepted, A-D-E-P-T-E-D, -E 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 simply meant attained or achieved. Magnifical, instead of magnificent. Not, not difficult to figure out. One of my favorites, obstupefact. I just love to say it, obstupefact. It means to deliberately make unclear. You're trying to muddle an issue, isn't that a great word? Yeah, and you can find it in a very big dictionary. You can find it, but it's obsolete. And another one that I love to say, it just feels so good in the mouth, admitulate. Admitulate, doesn't that sound educated? To reduce to nothing. 
And to demit someone means simply to send them away. Demit the young man out the door, please. As I've already mentioned, grammar was used very loosely by modern standards. Almost any word could be used as any other part of speech, and I neglected to say that was kind of a third category of Shakespeare's coinages. He would take an already existing word and use it as a new part of speech. For example, he is the first person known to have used the word torture as a verb. It already existed as a noun, okay? He did that a lot. Adverbs could be used as verbs, nouns for adjectives, nouns and adjectives could be used for verbs or adverbs. It's still going on. I'm old enough to remember when the word quality was strictly a noun, not an adjective, as it is today. He's a quality guy. You would have never heard that 60 years ago, but it's common today. And Shakespeare does it, and sometimes his usages simply didn't catch on, didn't stick. Quite famously, he speaks in Henry IV, Part Two, uncle me no uncle. He's using the word uncle as a verb, which I'm an uncle and I kind of like it, but if I used it that way, people would look strangely at me. And uh, to out Herod Herod, Herod as portrayed in the drama of the time was generally a bombastic, uh, unpleasant fellow who would curse and stomp up and down. Uh, so that's what he means when he's using the word Herod as a verb. And one of my favorites, how she might tongue me. You could use that a couple of different ways, but, it, but, it, but it's a great, great image. Shakespeare used a so-called, what we call a West Midlands variety of English. And that's significant because of where he grew up. The town of Stratford-on-Avon was and still is located more or less at the juncture of, the, of three of the main linguistic um, fields in, in England. Uh, specifically, Stratford was at the crossroads of the three great regional speech areas of England. Uh, to the south and west were the R-pronouncing counties of Somerset, Dorset, Devon, and Cornwall, which not incidentally was the provenance of many of the earliest settlers in Virginia. And the people, those people's descendants in America today, you may be among them, I am, uh, pr generally pronounce the R after a vowel that appears in the middle or at the end of a word. So for example, I will say, I park my car, okay? But there was another prominent speech area to the east of Stratford-on-Avon where people tended to drop the R. East Anglia, the eastern part of the Midlands, and they would tend to drop their R after a volcano, oh, <laughs> after a volcano, after a vowel sound in the middle or at the end of a word. And their descendants, some of them still live in places like Boston. And if you've ever been to Boston, you don't park your car, you do what? You park your car. And we, we laugh at it. But, but again, those people, the, the settlers in New England came predominantly from those Western Midlands counties and Shakespeare, because of where he grew up, would have heard both varieties. To the north were the old Danelaw counties, feeding into London English grammatical forms such as tells and speaks, rather than telleth and speaketh. If you have ever read Shakespeare's plays, one of the things you notice, if you're paying attention to the language, is that he uses both forms. Today we regard the TH ending on the end of a verb as being archaic. Right? But in his day, it was not only still current, it was perfectly acceptable. But today, we tend to end verbs in the second and third person with an S. He tells a story rather than he telleth a story. You'll find both in Shakespeare and other writers, but especially Shakespeare, and in the King James. They, the, most of those scholars who did that translation, and there were 50 or 60 of them in the early 1600s, they were working all over the country. As you probably know, the King James was the result of a, a, a team effort, several scholars working together. But the preponderance of them were from the East Midlands area linguistically, and that's why in the King James you still, still see those TH endings after, after verbs. There's really not any mystery to it. The King James Bible gives us, uh, as I mentioned, published in 1611. Books were expensive. Books were for, for wealthy people. They weren't a casual purchase as they are today. And many of the earliest settlers in what was to become the United States were poor people. So if they brought any book at all 
if it was only one book, it tended to be the King James, partly because of when it was published. As I mentioned, there were already English language versions of the Bible, but the King James caused a bit of a sensation because it is so beautiful to read and, frankly, a great deal clearer in terms of the meaning of the passages. Uh, anyway, it's not an accident that we have acquired a great many common everyday ordinary expressions from the King James Version of the Bible. For example, the root of the matter. It's been a while since I've heard that one, but I assume most folks in this room have heard it. How about know for a certainty? Do you know for a certainty that he's going to be here tonight? Turned the world upside down? Meaning, what, caused a sensation? And as a lamb to the slaughter? Maybe it's not mainstream English, but at least most folks are familiar with it. And beat swords into plowshares? And a man after his own heart? Or she's a girl after my own heart? We might change the wording from the original biblical wording, but that's where the, the notion comes from. How about a thorn in the flesh? I've heard a thorn in the side, a thorn in the skin. Fell flat on his face, meaning to fail utterly. And the skin of his, my teeth, that's the version, that's what's written in the meaning just barely, by the skin of our teeth. Put words in your mouth. Don't put words in my mouth, young man. I remember my mother saying that to me more than once. Stand in awe. Have you ever stood in awe of something? And put your own house in order. The actual wording is set thine own house in order. And pour out your heart. He poured out his heart to his boss, asking for a raise. And from time to time, Casual, ordinary phrases that we take, so take for granted come from the King James. I started out today talking about Sir Walter Raleigh and bringing English to the New World. The Indians were a huge influence. There were scores, perhaps hundreds, of Native American Indian words and phrases that became adopted into mainstream English. Many of them were changed in the process. Do you know who was the very first person to write the word raccoon? You know the guy associated with Jamestown, Virginia, John Smith. John Smith wrote it down in 1608, just a year after the settlement began. You wouldn't recognize it if you saw it in print. He was trying to apparently capture this, the pronunciation, and it looks like rah or it's three or four syllables and very guttural, but uh, eventually became simplified to the spelling we use today. Others were hickory, pecan, chipmunk, Moose, terrapin, what's a terrapin? Turtle. A kind of turtle. A quahog. Any New Englanders here? They'll know what a quahog is. Kind of it's a kind of clam, kind of seafood. If you go to uh, Plymouth Plantation today, you'll hear the words quahog if you go in a supermarket. Hominy, pemmican, totem, papoose, squaw, moccasin, tomahawk, and later kayak and igloo, depending on where in the country, we were, or on the continent, we were talking about. A scuppernong is a kind of wild grape that grows in the Chesapeake area. Opossum, skunk, squash are just a few more adopted into the English language about that time because of English contact with Native Americans. Indian phrases. These are frequently translations into English of native terms. At other times, they were English terms, but coined by Indians who had learned to speak English at about this time. Have you ever spoke of going on a scalp hunt? Meaning, looking for somebody to blame. Smoking a peace pipe? Putting on war paint? Fire water. For what? It was an, an English name, but used by Indians to describe Alcohol, alcoholic beverages. Play possum. What does it mean to play possum? To play dead, to play dead as a form of self-defense. And bury the hatchet? We've all heard these growing up with them, and most of us have forgotten where they came from. More Spanish, or more properly, other language words borrowed through Spanish are barbecue and chocolate. Both of those words come from the Caribbean and South American tribes. Enchilada, marijuana, plaza, stampede, and tornado are all originally Spanish, American Spanish words that got adopted into English. Scots and Scots-Irish were the next ethnic group after the English and the Africans. 
to come to this country. Anybody know when the first black people came to what is now the United States? This is an interesting bit of historical trivia because of the year. The year was 1619. That's a year before the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock. A group of about 20. They, they didn't call them slaves. They called them indentured servants, but they were here basically against their will, having been purchased by Dutch merchants who then sold them at Jamestown. That's where the first slaves, what eventually would become called slaves, were brought. The ongoing anxiety about language during this time, here are all words that were mentioned in print by somebody during the 1600s in England as being questionable words to include in our language voluntarily. Today we will laugh when we realize that people, some people worried at one time about words like sham. It does have kind of a low, low brow ring to it, doesn't it? Uh, it means phony or, or fake. Banter, a slang term for casual talk, mob. Again, indecorous behavior comes to mind when you hear that word. Bubble, what's wrong with bubble? Bully, cutting and shuffling. Also in the 1600s, we get the first questions about, oh golly, we're running out of time already? It is eight o'clock? Oh, please forgive me. There's so much more, but you may have sensed we're on the verge of starting to talk about the development of American English, which is what History of the English Language Part 3 is all about. Next time, we'll be focusing specifically on American English, and we've more or less touched the American shores with where we've wound up here today. And so be ready next time for more words from the Indians and from steamboats and railroads and cowboys and Indians and mountain men and the fur trade. And the whole history of our country is reflected in our version of the English language. Okay, we have thousands of Americanisms that are still not used by British people today. Okay, and I'll give you just a few samples of that next time. One of my favorites, you bet. <laughs> you never hear a Brit say, you bet. A British person will say, yes. But an American will say, yes, when he means yes. But if he means a real emphatic yes, he'll say, you bet and I use it all the time. That's just one. You've been, once again, an excellent audience. Oh, I wanted to point out to you that for handouts, I'm not gonna pass them out, but I'm gonna invite you to come up and help yourself. These are just a few, a handful, of the approximately 1,800 words and phrases that William Shakespeare is credited with coining, inventing, or at least popularizing, okay? Together with citations so that you can check the play, the act, the scene, and the line number if you want to. These, this is just a description of my presentations, including the three-part Shakespeare series, each of the three parts, the three parts of the English language history, and a new series, which I've developed in recent months and which has been very well received, called Little Known Stories from American History. If we have time next time, I'll give you one or two samples. Uh, this is something that I intended to read to you. Do you remember the humorous piece that I read at the beginning of last session? Well, this is... Uh, well, I won't take your time with it, but I... I uh, okay, there is a two-letter word that perhaps has more meanings than any other two-letter word, and that is up. It's easy to understand up, meaning toward the sky, or at the top of the list, but when we awaken in the morning, why do we wake? At a meeting, why does a topic come? Why do we speak? And why are the officers for election, and why is it to the secretary to write a report. We call our friends and we use it to brighten a room, polish the silver, we warm the leftovers and clean the kitchen. We lock the house and some guys fix the old car. At other times, the little word has real special meaning. People stir trouble, line for tickets, work an appetite and think excuses. To be dressed is one thing, but to be dressed is special. A drain must be opened because it is stopped. We open a store in the morning, but we close it at night. We seem to be pretty mixed about 
to be knowledgeable about the proper uses of up, look the word in the dictionary. In a desk-sized desk dictionary, it takes almost one quarter of the page and can add to about 30 definitions. If you are to it, you might try building a list of the many ways is used. It will take a lot of your time, but if you don't give, you may wind with a hundred or more. When it threatens to rain, we say it is clouding. When the sun comes out, we say it is clearing. When it rains, it wets the earth and often messes things. When it doesn't rain for a while, things dry. One could go on and on, but I'll wrap it. For now my time is, so it is time to shut. Now it's to you what you do with this message. <laughs> Help yourself. Help yourself to copies of that if you would like. Here are brochures and business cards with my contact information. And uh, once again, thank you for being here today.